Hello again. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about a new topic that I'm working on and I find it actually quite fascinating, which is the topic of quantum computer, quantum computing and quantum computers. So probably some of you have heard about all of these quantum computers that are appearing at the moment. Some of them come from Google, some of them come from IBM. This is actually a very interesting topic, uh, not only because these computers are slightly different to the ones that we already have that are the classical computers, but also because we don't really know how to make them work properly, which is one of the things that I want to talk about today, but just slightly because I want to make a video only about this. And second, because they are changing completely the way that we think about programming. And that's something fascinating. So kind of similar to what functional programming did, but actually not just changing the way that we do things, but also the way that we think about the hardware and about the basics. Let's have a look to this. So in order to give you a little bit about how a quantum program actually works, I need to refer to the renal programs. I need to refer to a program itself. For those who have no idea about programming, basically a program is just a set of instructions. These instructions are going to be executed one after another in a CPU. And basically what is gonna happen is that the programs are gonna be working with bits and they're gonna have input outputs. It's important to tell that this input output behavior is normally deterministic, but not always deterministic. It doesn't happen all of the time. So for example, if you have a, a search based algorithm, just by changing initial conditions of the algorithm will completely change the, the optimization process and will change the output. So when you are working with the statistical programs, things are going to be different, but in general, a program aims to be deterministic. Then we have the programming languages. So basically you have a million different programming languages depending on what you want to do. If you want to go to the low level, you have assembly. I wouldn't say this 10 years ago, but now you also have C in the low level. It used to be a high level language. You also have languages that are something in, somewhere in the middle, like C++, Java, modern languages like RAS, languages that are a bit more democratic like Python, languages for the browser, for example, like JavaScript or TypeScript, which is the type version of JavaScript. You also have languages for the backends of the web pages like PHP, and you also have a specific language, for instance, for statistics and things like that, like R, okay? All of these languages uh, have different features, and basically they are providing you with different environments in order to create your program. So let's have a look to a program itself. So in front of you, you just have a Python program that is going to take the numbers from one to 10, and it's gonna check whether the numbers are odd or even, and it's gonna print that, okay? So for that, it's gonna use a variable called number, okay? This number is the one that is gonna be taking the values, and you are gonna have also in the program, you will see that there are maybe some comments and things like that, but mainly you are gonna have a loop. So the loop is this four uh, sentence that you have here, where you have the, 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 the duration of the variable and the range for the values, and basically what the loop is saying, I want you to repeat the next code as many times as this variable is taking these values, okay? So it will be repeated 10 times because the variable will be taking the values from one to 10. And whether you repeat it, you are repeating that block that is inside of the loop, and you see that it's inside because you are indenting the block, okay? And what is inside of the block? So basically inside of the block, the first thing that you're gonna have is a condition. This condition is going to compare, uh, uh, this condition is going to check whether the value of number is even or odd, and once you have satisfied the condition, you will print, in this case the condition is checking whether the value is even, you will print that the value is even, and if the condition is not satisfied, you will assume that the value is odd. And these are gonna be the outputs of the program. So okay, this is good. So for instance, this variable is going to be a set of bits, okay? Or bytes, if you want to summarize. But one of the things that is interesting is that every computer is working with these bits. And this is very important because this is what is gonna change. So every bit either has a value zero or one, okay? And you are gonna have operations on top of the bits to be able to do everything that we have defined in this program. But as I said, things change. And things change when we move from 
classical computers to quantum computers. So now we are not going to work with bits. Bits originally have the value either the value 0 or the value 1. What we are going to do is to work with quantum bits or qubits, which are going to have both the value 0 and 1 with different probabilities. And you might say, what that means? So let's talk about showing their cuts. So the cut can be alive or dead. Okay? So it has some probability of being alive or being dead. And you won't know whether the cut is alive or dead until you open the box. So that process of opening the box is called measurement. But imagine that then if you close the box and you reopen it again, you just see that the cat has changed the state. So the cat is at the same time alive and dead. And depending on how you open and close the box, or how many times you do that, you will find that sometimes the cat is alive and sometimes the cat is dead. It's a magical cat, as you can imagine, it's just a metaphor. But that's what's going to happen with the qubit. Sometimes I will just look at the qubit, it will have the value zero, Sometimes I will look at it, it will have the value 1, and it will be depending on the probability of this uh, specific states. We will see that there are going to be operations on top of this. We will see that this can be applied uh, specifically in some problems, but this is going to be for another video. For this one, I'm just going to focus on the concept itself. And I want to give you also a little bit of the mathematical definition. So here, you just have the definition of the qubit. You have this alpha and beta, which are the probabilities that I was talking about, because they are probability distribution. By definition, the probabilities of their values need to add to 1, but they are going to be complex numbers, which is important to recall. Okay? They are not going to be natural numbers. Why is this? Because you will have like different phases, different movements of the qubit. I will explain this in the future, but basically I will just want you to let you know that Every time we open the box, as I mentioned, we will just find one of the two states, states that we have here, either 0 or 1. Our, what we are going to use to open the box is what is called a measurement. There are two new features in the quantum programs. One is entanglement. Basically, if you have multiple qubits and you want to make sure that one qubit is completely related to another one or completely entangled with another one, what you are doing in this case is that both of them are going to have exactly the same value when I, when I measure them. So if I have my box, or I have two boxes with two cuts, if the cuts are entangled, once a cut is dead, the other one is dead. Once a cut is alive, the other one is alive. So I only need to look at one of the cuts to know how the other one is. And at the same time, uh, we are going to have superposition. That is basically what I was just defining before. So basically, I will have, like let's say, 50% of the time the cat will be alive and the other 50% the cat will be dead or 10, 90, whatever. This is going to be the superposition state when you have two states at the same time, okay? But now we are changing more things about quantum programming and the programming paradigm. Now we have that the states, are, the outputs are not deterministic by default. So obviously you can try to create like a deterministic quantum program but that makes no sense. Just create a classical program for that. So basically, we will have uh, every time that we get an output from the program, it will be different or it will be likely to be different. And this is very interesting because this uh, change the way that we are going to work with the input output behavior because we will have probability distributions in the output. One extra note that is also very important is that this is ideal. But in the real world, things are not as good as we expect and quantum computers are going to have noise. The classical computers also have noise, but we will see a little bit more about how this noise affects to the quantum computer. So what we are going to have is the NIST computer, which is the noise intermediate scale quantum computer. And basically this computer is going to have noise because the qubits are going to pass through a process of decoherence of the energy level. And basically what this is going to make is that the qubits are going to have different energy levels at different times and these energy levels are going to be the ones and zeros but because the energy levels are changing there will be a moment that we won't be able to distinguish between what, a, what is a one and what is a zero and basically this leads to the solution or what is called the problem of calibration so basically every time that we have like the coherence 
a person needs to go to the room and needs to calibrate the computer. So this is before because we have these superconductor transmon qubits that basically are using a resonance phenomenon to create entanglement. Um, and that produces a lot of noise and actually it leads to the coherence. So basically, just to give you a small idea about how sensitive this calibration is, from our collaborators from IBM, we know that if such a person just go to a room with a mobile phone close to a quantum computer, they can just break the calibration. So this is actually very bad and very sensitive. And basically during the calibration, what you are defining is the energy levels and you are putting a discrimination in the middle. But this discrimination will change the moment that the energy levels should change the moment that the energy levels change. But normally the discrimination is static. So this is something that we are working at the moment. But just to let you know, basically you are forced to recalibrate and you are forced to do it normally like twice per day. So as we were talking about programming languages, we also have quantum programming languages. Uh, there are many of them depending on the, the creator and depending on what they are trying to do. But basically the ones that I normally focus are the ones based on Python because they are the easier ones to start with and the one in which I'm working is Qiskit, okay? And this is the one that we are going to use for all of the examples. Okay, so now we have the quantum languages. So let's think about what's a quantum program, okay? So how do we design a quantum program? So basically a quantum program is going to be something quite similar to an electronical circuit, but it's going to be called a quantum circuit. You will have qubits, okay, that are going to be represented like cables. You will have gates that are going to be re represented like logic gates. And something that you don't have in, in, in an electronic circuit, you will have a specific bytes or bits. In this case, they're, they're going to be bits because we don't have too many qubits. So we will have maybe one qubit per bit or maybe multiple qubits and fewer bits, etc., etc. And you will have measurements. The measurements will be connecting the state of the qubit with the bits. Okay? So you are not going to read the qubits directly, you are going to be reading the bits. And that's the measurement that you are going to do at the end of the quantum program. And that's going to be your output. So let's have a look to how this circuit actually looks like. So basically we have three qubits, okay? Qubit 0, 1, and 2. And basically in the circuit we have gates. The first gate that we have applied to the qubit 0 is a Hadamard gate that is going to put the qubit in superposition. So basically it will pass from only the state 0, that is the state by default, to have 50% probability on state 0 and 50% probability on state 1. Good. Then we have an entanglement between the qubit 0 and the qubit 1, that is that line that you see in the middle in the gates area, and you have another entanglement between the qubit 0 and the qubit 2. This is going to put the three qubits at the same level. So basically what is going to happen here is that every single qubit is going to have the same state. So if the qubit 0 is 0, all of the qubits are going to be 0 when we do the measurement. And if the qubit 0 is 1, all of the qubits are going to be 1 when we do the measurement. Then in the right side, you can see the measurements. And they are connected with those lines at the bottom that are going to be the bits. And we will be reading the bits when we read the output of the program. Just to give you an overview about the code, you can see at the top how we are defining the circuit with the three qubits. Then we are defining the Hadamard gate. We are defining entanglement between the qubits, what I was just explaining before. And what we are defining then are the measurements. So basically, the measurements are said, I'm going to connect the qubit 0, 1, 2 with the bytes, or the, sorry, 0, 1, 2. Once we do the measurement, we will send the quantum circuit as a job with a specific number of shots that we want to measure. In this case, 1,000. So we are going to generate 1,000 outputs because we want to see the probability distribution. So we will do like 1,000 samples to see. And this is going to be sent to a simulator. And then once the job finished, we will be collecting the results. So now let's have a look to the results. Let's have a look to what is happening actually in the simulator. So we can see that in the simulator, we have actually the two expected states, 000, 111, and all of the other states have zero probability. That's really good. That's actually what we wanted. And you can see actually that the probability of the state 000 and the state 111 is almost the same, which is basically what is expected because we are doing uniform sampling. All of the states have the same probability considering all of the states are the possible states, okay? So then 
let's see the next part. What happens if we send this to a real computer? Are we going to have the same output? So we can see that when we send this to a real computer, the output is completely different. We can see that, for instance, 000 has more probability than 111, a significant amount more probability, but not only that. We also have impossible states. There are states like 001 or 110 that shouldn't be there, but actually represented with some probability. And this is because of the coherence of the qubits. And this is something that is going to be affecting to your potential quantum computers in the future. So basically, my next video, I'm going to be talking about how we are dealing with this problem and how we are trying to solve it, okay? But just to show you a little bit about, you know, like a small trailer of what is happening here, if we just have a look to the energy level of the qubit, we can see here three different qubits, the blue, the, the green, and the, and the red one. And basically, we can see that the discrimination between the two areas, one related to zero, one related to one, it's clear for the blue one, but very, very unclear for the green one. And actually, when these clouds get very, very close, it's very difficult to distinguish between a zero and a one at the energy levels. And there's some point that it just makes no sense. And that's the reason you need calibration. So basically, this is just to give you a slightly small explanation of what, what is happening here, but we will say a bit more about this so then, we can just go to the open problems that we have in quantum computers. So if you want to work on this, you have a lot of things that you can do from the software engineering perspective. So for example, creating more robust quantum computers by itself, testing quantum programs, testing quantum computers, making quantum system more democratic so more people can access them, which is something important. And last but not least, finding real applications. So there are applications obviously for chemistry, for machine learning, people are trying to find applications in several different fields, the application for encryption, but it would be good to have more like, you know, all the applications that we can actually identify, and, and that's something that I think should be one of the main targets in order to motivate the research on quantum computers. Okay, so that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you like it, so please, if you are interested about more videos about quantum computers, let me know in the comment. And also subscribe if you are more interested about more material that I'm also developing. And thank you for your time. See you.